My guest today is Jerry Nixon. Jerry, how are you, my friend? Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. This is fun. I've been here before, but boy almighty, it yeah. was several years ago. It was a long time. It was back when you and I used to work together, which was, were amazing times. And uh, We were both children the, at the time. We were so little <laughs> and cute. <laughs> What's, uh, what are you doing these days for a living? Well, I mean? I, yeah, well, we still are at Microsoft together, but that's for sure. So back then it was evangelism, right? Where we were talking about all the cool things. I can remember, I can't remember where we were, but I can remember it was like a closet we were filming in. That I can remember. <laughs> that's right. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, no, you know, that w what happens is evangelism, we all graduated into uh, field engineering and CSE, now yeah. ISE. And um, a handful of years ago, um, I started getting really interested in, in product management, and so I decided to go over to one of my loves. If there are two technology loves that I have, the first one is .NET, without a doubt, and uh, partly the, mm -hmm. the fact I grew up on it and it paid my mortgage my entire life. And the other is SQL Server, which in a, bre in, a in a kind of a peanut butter and jelly scenario, .NET is the peanut butter, and uh, it's just not the same without the jelly, and that's always been SQL Server. So I go over to the SQL Server team, which is now under Azure Data, and uh, they're like, hey, you know what you want to do? You want to advocate for engineers through an evangelism effort inside SQL. I'm like, you, that is what I want to do. That sounds and perfect for you. I know. And they said, well, you got to be in charge of something. Um, how about Data API Builder? I'm like, all right. And then they show me, and I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I definitely want to do. It was heartbreaking that I didn't know what Data API Builder was before I joined the team. Now that I know it, it is a passion to make sure <laughs> that everybody does know what it is because it is spectacular. It was in preview when I showed up. We brought it to GA Sense, and um, okay. it's perhaps one of the most life-changing tools you will ever use, David, and I'm not overstating it. It is life-changing. Unbelievable in a, at a, in a technology sense, not life changing, like, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it is truly awesome. I do, and, yeah. and I don't want to say the word revolutionized because it's too big, but it could do amazing things to the development process if uh, development if developers start learning about it. It's neat. Very cool. So I feel less bad about the fact that I don't know anything about it. Uh, right. You acknowledge that you didn't know when you joined. So I, I'm here to learn. What? For, let's start with it. What is it? What's Data API Builder? It's or let me let me back up to the problem and then I'll talk about this it as the solution. Okay. And so the problem is that you and I are asked to build applications. And when we do, we build something on the client. We build, of course, a database, hopefully SQL Server, but that's not a requirement, not even for Data API Builder. But so you have a client and database. We put something in between. And more often than not, all that we put in between is a data API with mostly CRUD operations. So we get CRUD something create, along read, the line. Create, update, delete. Create, read, update, and delete. Right. And, and it should be called CRUD because it's create, read, update, delete, and execute. Because when I interact up with a uh, store procedure, none of those others really make sense. It's you're executing store procedure. But nobody says that. I, maybe I should start saying we should call it. Maybe that would be my next my next blog article. You should, it's all CRUD. Anyway. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I got a term I can put my name on. But the uh, uh, anyway, so we have this thing in the middle that's the data API, and in general, it doesn't do anything special. It just you, you go back to your previous uh, projects, you copy and paste the code from there, you build a repository, maybe an entity framework, and you build a, a, a handful of APIs or controllers or minimal APIs or whatever it is you're up to these days, and you're like, hey, this is how you get. This is how you post. This is how you put. And it's the same thing project to project to project. And all it really means is we have to build all the repositories. We have to build all the endpoints. We have to then build all the unit tests for both the repositories and the endpoints. Then we have to up the, update our CI CD pipeline so that we can handle and execute all of those things as well. Basically, we introduce almost a third of the code inside our application that is just copy and pasted from other projects. And if there is a tweak, the tweak is so minor that it could show up either in the client or the database. And it's just this constant repetition of code over and over again. And even worse yeah. is that the technology around data APIs keeps evolving. And so the .NET team is like, no, no, you want to do it like this. And you want to have caching and you want to have pass-through path, path yeah. authentication and you want to have all these other things. 
And you're like, now it's going to take just even a little bit more. And so you have your development team busy spending cycles and, you know, development costs uh, to, in order to build something that's so stupid that you shouldn't even have to. There should be a tool out there that just drops a data API on top of a database for you. And that's the data API builder. Yeah, I, I call really that plumbing, does. the stuff that's uh, it's important. I, I, don't, I wouldn't call it stupid. It is important, but it's it's mundane. It's not part of build. You're not solving a business problem. You're just doing the same no. thing over and over again, as you pointed out. It's fun to write the very first time because you're like, I wonder how these things work. But after the second, third time, you're like, I, I'm just doing the same thing repetitively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes uh, the so joy what's out. um, what, tell me how how do we use it? What's uh, as a developer, what do I need to do? So here's what's cool. So it's not a code gen or anything along those lines. It's just, it runs inside a container and you okay. create a JSON file that describes your database. So let's say you have a Postgres. So it supports Postgres and SQL Server, uh, Cosmos DB and MySQL. Those are the four big ones. And so if you're using one of those on, in the cloud, on-prem, in AWS, wherever it is, you just describe your database and the connection information in a JSON file. You provide that to the container and everything else just magically happens. And it's pretty nice because it's secure and feature rich. It's all the stuff that your team would have done if they had the time to do it. And so we have a lot of customers who are like, we have a policy in our organization now that we can no longer talk to our database directly. And this is very common right. by the way. And it's really yeah, kind of cool. Idea, it's, it's, it is a good idea. It's cool to have all this information now that I'm on the SQL team because I have access and kind of connect, like interaction with customers um, very different than I had before, right? Because it's the large, large customers that are just trying to do things. You're like, why are you doing it? It doesn't even matter. They have regulations on top of them and all the all kinds of pressure. And so they're like, I need a data API on top of my database. Um, it was It's required now for my company. And I don't even have a development team. And so they will use Data API Builder, and they can, frankly, use a citizen developer to stand up a Data API that's as awesome as any other API you could build. And it's pretty cool how quickly you can put it together. It's not it's not low code. It is zero code. It's just that JSON mm -hmm. file fed into a container. You can run that container anywhere, on-prem Kubernetes, cloud Kubernetes, ACA, ACI, I don't know, Azure Container Apps, Azure Container Instances. Um, Anywhere a container can run. And if you don't know how to run a container, because that is a reality probably for 75% of all the tech out tech users out there, um, you can run it inside like static web apps and they'll they'll hide the container behind the scenes for you. It's amazing, David. I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of the neatest things. And it's not full of a bunch of compromises and shortcuts. It's really great. Um, so what's in this JSON file? Is it the schema of the database, the connection string, or both? Uh, validation rules? What, what, what do you put in there? Yeah, well, honestly, all the things. And so uh, let okay. me show you one because it's, oh, okay, it's yeah. one, one, once you see it, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of boring. And that's what we want it to be, right? And not something that's like <laughs> it's super, <a> <laughs> yeah, we don't want something that's super duper exotic. So let me pull it up. I have a, uh, it's a DAB config file here. And DAB is Data API Builder. So a DAB config okay. file, this is a really basic one. Um, but the truth of the matter is this is all you need. The only thing that would be more more super duper if you had your own company would be more tables. That's the only thing. Everything else is, is standard across every implementation. Yeah, so just like you said, the connection information is here. So there is a connection string. And if you're using... Um, if you're using passwords, we support that. If you're not using passwords, but you're using system managed identities, that's okay as well. Or so user managed identities, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that that is. It's not an always an option for customers, right? They are they're in an environment where they have certain things that are pushed on them, and so they just have to do it the way they do it. So we support it all the way around. Yeah. This is an example where it's reading from an environment variable, and uh, okay. that's pretty common because since I'm in a container, it's easier to write. My, all my secrets into an environment variable and then just read from those. That's a lot easier and a lot more Got standard. It. Yeah. So that's it. The, line one through one through eight here just says, this is how I connect to my SQL server. And the, uh, the next little block of runtime just says, I'm going to have a rest endpoint. And this is the, how I want you to access it. In this case, it's slash API, but we also support GraphQL as well. So, um, GraphQL is awesome. I mean, it really has so many capabilities around it and a lot of developers are attracted to it, but they think about it as a 
as one or the other. So are we going to abandon rest and go to graph or are we going to abandon graph and go to rest, whichever way you think about it. But the way Data API Builder does it, we're like, just you can have them both. And so you can set up rest right here on line 11 or you can go down to line 16 and then also set up graph and you can have them both at the same time, which is really nice when you think about some clients um, are all rest today but they're considering graph and this allows them to sort of dabble into it. Some clients are 100% graph and they don't use gra uh, rest for anything except for this one operation. And uh, this supports that as well. And so it's really, really nice to uh, kind of meet developers where they are. For those of us who aren't really that familiar with GraphQL, can you please define yeah. it for us? Yeah, so GraphQL is simply a query language on top of HTTP. That's all that it is. It allows you to write uh, not just asking for one table or one entity, but multiple tables either in parallel or in series or nested. And so wow. I can have this nice complex query that it, I'm not, it, the way REST works is I go to the user endpoint and I get the user entity. But the way GraphQL works is I go to the GraphQL endpoint and I get the user and I get all of their um, invoices and I get their photo and I get everything in a single query and I can start to pare down all of the properties and all the fields that are in there. So a lot of people think about this with Microsoft Graph, but that's a graph database, totally different concept. We're really just talking about a query language. Yeah, it's cool stuff. And honestly, you can see the appeal. If you have a mobile application, GraphQL can tr really transform the bandwidth requirement because you can say, give me all the things I need for this UI, um, except for drop all the fields I don't, I'm not interested in. So imagine a UI that shows invoices. It'll show the invoice, all the line items, and then also the product photo for each of those. I don't have to do an individual query to every endpoint for those. It's a oh, single okay. query that I write. Really, it's beautiful. The, the, the reverse is also beautiful. When I do a mutation and I update something, I can update mm -hmm. my inf I can insert my invoice and all of the line items together as a single block, and they all run inside a single transaction. Nice. Even if the developer who created the GraphQL endpoint never thought of that. They're like, I didn't think about you, you uploading all of those. And so you can still do it because GraphQL supports it. In the REST world, if you wanted to support something like that, you'd have to have a custom endpoint. And so this is the okay. idea that you just don't need it. You don't need a custom endpoint. You just need custom queries. Ah, OK. All right. All right. So what else is in here? I see some telemetry stuff, I guess, stuff for logging. And yeah, for uh, logging which... and traceability to make sure that you can have a single pane of glass to be able to see everything. Mm -hmm. That's important. Obviously, you want to have some sort of observability around it as well if you start having errors. And and did you, on, honestly, just even regular production operations. So those that's what happens. We log natively, of course, and uh, we also ship that telemetry then up to Application Insights if you use it. So it's really nice. In fact, uh, the way... The way Azure works is, or the way, your, way Azure product development works is everything works in semesters. So every six months we have a new major plan. And so the next semester is right on top of us where it's called Selenium and we're about to uh, go right into it. And so we're gonna, uh, we're talking about new syncs. So, you know, a sync is where you drop all of your logs. And so Good we have, right. a th this is one of our syncs and we're gonna add a few more as we move forward. Anyway, line 38 is where it all kind of starts. And just so you can see what one would look like, I have a, I have an actor table. It's just the name of the table. And it pulls from DBO actor. It's a table. I could point to a view, a store procedure. Uh, I could point to a, a NoSQL document as well and, and, and kind of navigate through that. It's up to me how I want to look at. And the, I'll tell you what's cool about it is all of this can be added together in one place. So if I have a Cosmos DB and a SQL Server relational database, I can query them at the exact same time, get back a single payload. One of them is a NoSQL document. Another is you know, a bunch of related entities at the same time. So it's, uh, it's this idea of everything being disparate and, and, and in its own little isolated silo, this brings it all together. So you have a, a lot of options when it comes to designing your architecture topology and being able to make choices that are just frankly better than what we've had before and don't require so much develop. Don't require any development. It's just what you put inside this document or inside this JSON file. It's really amazing. Each, each individual entity that has its own set of permissions, each individual entity then has its own set of relationships so that you can navigate to other okay. things. Even if you don't have mm -hmm. a relationship defined in your database, we just, enable it. Oh. It, it. It's really great. We can make a crappy database look awesome. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, so now, what? Uh, do, how do I generate this file? This isn't something I have to type in by hand, is it? No, it certainly is something you can type in by hand, obviously. But we have a full CLI that you can install as a .NET tool, and you could just say .NET tool install data API builder, and then you can say you can add a you can add a table, you can add a store procedure, you can update the relationships, everything from the CLI. It's actually quite, in fact, just to show you real quick, this is the this is the architecture. I don't want to go over it because I think we've explained it enough. It's just everything's in memory and stateless and very, very nice. Okay. But what I want to just kind of scroll down is just show you that what the CLI command looks like. So here's how this red right here is how I would initialize the the configuration file the very first time. So I would just say okay. dab init. So that's the the dab is the driver and init is the verb. And now they're calling it the sub command instead of the verb now. And they're called the command and sub command. But you and I grew up calling these the driver and the verb. So it's funny how things change. And then these flags say, I have a Microsoft SQL server. Here's my connection string. And in this case, I'm saying it's in the host mode development. That builds it. And then there are other commands where I would add an actor or add a table. So it's just as simple as dab add actor. And then you tell it the table name and what the permissions are going to be. And on and on it goes. The relationships you add the same way. Telemetry you add the same way. And so doing it in the as a CLI makes it so, frankly, it's more appealing to a lot of developers who are who enjoy the terminal. But it also makes it so that as your as your configuration file gets to thousands of lines, a JSON file is easy to edit, but a stray comma is a nightmare, right? To figure out where that is, sure. and so the CLI just makes it so you never have to open the JSON file unless you really, really want to. Yeah, so right. it's nice. Yeah, are you a terminal guy, David? Uh, it depends on the day. <laughs> I certainly don't <laughs> love like the idea of typing in the thousand lines of JSON. And uh, debugging yeah. that. That's a that's a pain in the neck. Yeah. Not if you type it right. Yeah. If you do it right the first time, <laughs> you, <can't laughs> <solve>. you don't <laughs> even need a try catch block if you just do things right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. I mean there's a part of me that loves the CLI, there's a part of me that absolutely hates the CLI. And so uh, another thing we're th we're doing as this semester uh, starts is we're building a configurator UI to make it so that if you'd rather just use a, a an, an interface and just like drag and drop style build out this configuration file hopefully uh, sometime next year we'll have the configurator completely built so that you that's another option for developers who when you say just do it in the command line they're like oh gosh well now we have we've got the command line for the command line and we've got the ui for the other type of developers and the idea is just reduce the friction i don't care what language you use or what technology stack you have mm -hmm. like this is just interacting with http and json objects and so this basically no matter what tech you're using this is completely uh, compatible with you because it's how you would build your data api anyway and hopefully it reduces it. tons of overhead from the perspective of what you have to write the number of hours you're gonna have to spend building it and then back to this issue of testing and validate debugging handling all those are gone we just drop in data API builder, and now you have your data API. It's pretty sweet. I get the setup, setup part. We have to somehow create this JSON file, uh, mm. presumably through this command line. And, yeah. But uh, but once I have the JSON file in place, then what does my code change? What happens inside of my code when I want to call that database? And your, no. So remember, this file is something that you in that you hand off to the container where data api builder runs so this is a standard mcr container so just imagine um like like you know like you might do an aspire so you have a container that runs your web app you have a con maybe you have a container that runs your database and in the middle you have a container that runs your data api those are all wired together through some sort of vnet that you already have set up and the idea is this middle container that you would have had to have done anyway now it doesn't have to be a custom container. It can be a standard MCR container that we provide. And the only thing you have to do is give it the JSON file. And from that point forward, it acts like a custom data API for you. And so there's the, to interact okay. with it, you just call it over HTTP. And then you get Got JSON it. back just like you would any data API. So if you're a .NET developer, this is not better for you because you're a .NET developer. If you're a, if you're a JavaScript developer, this is also not better for you. If you're a Python developer, you, there is no language component to this because it's just a container that exposes your database. From that point forward, you just use whatever your language's equivalent of an HTTP client is and just interact with it 
as JSON, right? You're just like I think I see. I think I'll, I'll paraphrase or give an example here. So in the in the JSON file you showed earlier, you enabled the API interface. You said the the, the um, path was slash API, and I forget what the actor was, but assume there's a table called customer. Uh, yeah. Table, okay. And in there, there's then you would just simply make an HTTP GET request to API slash customer. And that would return all the customers. And if you added a query string on there to filter it, then that would filter 100%. those customers. You do have a hundred percent customer. That's we have a, okay. We have a we infer the path, but we allow you to put it in there if you want to. So you could just mm -hmm. as easily do it like this to ensure that now it's your data API slash API slash customer. Now you get back your Got customer. It. And right. if you wanted to uh, uh, insert a row, you would do a post to that, correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. In okay. fact, we have we have here. A, um, all of the actions that Anonymous is allowed to do, I had star there, but you could have create and let's just say read Ooh, and nothing and nothing like this. Yeah, well, it's a, it's we have a we have a schema on this JSON file, so it gives you know nice. all Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code both give you that kind of automatically. What's cool about this is now that I've done this, it says that if you're anonymous and you haven't been authenticated and you have a specific role. You could still insert a record and you could still read all the records, but you can't go delete a record, for example. And so now I could have another role because you know you can see here it's just a uh, it's an array. And so I could have another role and it's responsible for deleting or maintaining or maybe you could only read as anonymous. And so that sort of by the by the table permission. So you don't have to go to your DBA and, and change the permissions. You don't have to create, you know, special entries into your uh, Active Directory or anything along those lines. You can control everything from here and make it so that each of your APIs does what it's supposed to. The other thing I can do, and even though I, I wasn't planning on showing you this, but it's pretty cool. Another thing I can do here is create a policy. And so it is very similar to, um, well, almost any scripting language where I could say like at item dot ID is greater than 10. Or I could say the the user, or let's say owner ID it equals the at claims dot user ID. Right, and so now it's the person that so comes in. You can only in. read your own data. Right, so you can make it really fancy if you want to. Uh, you mentioned the data sources that you, have, you can support Postgres and SQL, and uh, I think you said Cosmos and MySQL. What about if I'm using a framework already? Uh, what if I'm using like a uh, any, uh, entity framework or something like that? Does it interact with that at all? Not at all. No, this talks directly to your okay. database, and then you talk directly okay, to so it, it over that HTTP. Idea. It does, but it doesn't erase it. And the reason I say that is some of your API is going to need, is likely going to be some sort of business operation that is not just crud against the database. Correct. And so if you have that, this is not to replace that. This just replaces the crud. If you have business operations that you're like, you know, dot launch the missile, then that API... API, you ha still have to write it, and maybe you'll still be using Entity Framework, and maybe you'll still be using whatever it is you have. This doesn't replace that. It, I mean, theoretically, I guess you could trigger it off of a database update, but don't 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 go exotic. Just go ahead and build your your business API the way you should, and let your CRUD just be replaced mm -hmm. by this. Yeah. Um, I, I like that idea. This is the custom stuff. That's where you as a developer should be focused. That's where that's your right. work should go. These things that's, right here that are the plumbing, uh, let the tool take care of that. Yeah, that's exactly right. The special, the special logic and like business value that you're adding to your code can't be inferred. So you can't give me a JSON file that I try and figure it out. Only you can do it. And so that that hasn't yeah. changed. Yeah. Is there a cost to this? No, it's open source and free. Very cool. Good answer. Yeah, it's crazy. That, I mean, and and it doesn't have to be in Azure. Like I said, Cosmos DB, uh, that has to be in Azure. But SQL okay. can be in Azure. SQL can be in AWS. SQL can be on-prem. Uh, we have a lot of customers that run all of this on-prem. Like they are not, they're not cloud. They're not hybrid. They're nothing. They're all, everything is on-prem, and they use Data API Builder as the solution. That's fine. We don't care. We just want to make it easy to use these databases. And so, you know, you could get Postgres as a service inside Azure. That's the reason we support Postgres right now out of the box. You can get MySQL as a service in Azure. That's the reason we support MySQL, which seems weird. You know, when I first learned, I'm like, what do we support on the back end? We support, you know, SQL, ah, oh, Cosmos, ah, oh, Postgres, really? 
my seek what and i realize now because that's the family of azure databases and we're just trying to make it so all of them are value are you know, are easily accessible just turns out those also run on prem and you can use it there as well so it's pretty cool no no pre prerequisite for uh for microsoft anything it's wild nice uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is critical for people to know uh, it's super duper i think is about the most important thing dave <laughs> all right where if people want to get started with this thing where's the best place to send them yeah the easiest just we i have an aka so aka.ms that's the like the bitly for microsoft so it's aka.ms slash dab, D-A-B. That, that'll take you right to our repository. And the, the valuable part of the repository, too, is not just to get the code and link to the docs and stuff. There's also a section at the very beginning. In fact, let me, let me, let me pull it up because I'll do, I'll do the same thing with you here, then, right? So it's aka.ms slash dab. It'll take you right I to the... There myself. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Open in a browser on the another part, part here. And uh, when it does, it... Um, at the top of the readme here is a nice little sign up to join the community. And so because this is all open source and community driven and we receive pull requests from the community as well, but we have a major engineering investment internally as well. Um, but you can join here, be part of the roadmap, help us make decisions on what features come next. We definitely used everybody who signed up to help us plan for the next semester. And that's the reason we have some of the things prioritized the way that we do because of the feedback that we got from our community. So it's um. It's pretty sweet and it's weird, you know, sometimes you're on a product and you kind of dance around all of its problems and you just try and say how great it is, but just don't do it this way. It's not like that with Data API Builder. It, it really is. It really is great. And uh, we respond to the issues and we the discussions, all the work is in public right here on the repository. When we talk about things, it's out so the community can be involved as well. And, and it's not necessary for you to join the community in order to use it. It's, and we don't even care if you ever submit a pull request. I mean, it's neat if you do. But uh, the fact that you can um, just kind of doubles down on the fact that this is open source in a lot of the ways that .NET talks about how .NET is open source now too. Jerry, you've opened my eyes to a, a whole new world here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, David. I'm, man, I'm glad we got to talk about this. I, uh, it's too bad we're not face to face. It's a lot of fun when we are. Soon, I hope. Yeah, yeah that's right. All right, buddy. Thanks. Here's the thing with Data API Builder. It's one of those like technologies that once you start using it and introducing it and giving it to your development team, you're making friends fast because it's that thing that says, take all the nonsense that you don't want to do off your plate and Data API Builder can do it for you. So it's a pretty cool technology all the way around.